Hello, a couple of minutes behind here, but welcome into another edition of the Wolverine.com podcast here on the Wolverine. Of course, as you guys know, the Wolverine is on the On3 Sports Network now. So description below, you can find out how to sign up for a one-year subscription for a dollar. So that's the sales pitch. Let's get that out of the way now. I'm Anthony Broom here with Ryan Van Bergen, former Michigan Wolverines defensive lineman. After what we what we feared, whoa, I hear myself as an echo there. Uh, what we feared might have been, not feared, but a uh, potential trap game on the table for Michigan the week ahead of the Ohio State game. We all saw what Ohio State did to Michigan State on Saturday. They lived up to their end of the bargain. Michigan lived up to its end of the bargain. Uh, actually scored more points than Ohio State did on Saturday in a 59-18 win over the Maryland Terrapins. I mean, this was truly, Ryan, um, this was a team win. All three phases of the game, offense, defense, special teams, they all had their moments. So uh, right off the bat, I guess, what stands out? What's your instant reaction right after uh, the clock hit zero here? It was a clean football game, and that's kind of what we hoped for. I think Tagovailoa, he's a great athlete. I think he's a better runner than I think I gave him credit for, or anyone really gives him credit for, running away from guys like Josh Ross. But, uh, you know, they got, they had some offense going. Uh, they picked up some yards, which I'm sure – a little bit because it hit me a little bit like, oh, they're getting easy runs, they're getting first downs. But overall, it was a really good performance, uh, like you said, through all three facets. Something that I think we've kind of overlooked and been spoiled by this year has been our special teams. Our special teams has just been so solid. Uh, they haven't made any big plays too much yet, but obviously they showed up in this game. And we're going to need all three facets for the next one. So it was a good team win, you know, zero turnovers, uh, taking care of the football, uh, not really having any too many explosive plays against us. It's as uh, good of as a performance as you can hope for and what we needed heading into the last run. Yeah, and for as much as been made about Michigan's balance offensively or how they've called games, I can't imagine there are too many games, at least too many Michigan wins in the history of the program where they throw the ball more than they ran the ball. Threw the ball uh, 40 times on Saturday for 352 yards and then 35 rushes for 151 yards. Uh on the ground. So what did you make of the balance in this game, Ryan? I did notice right away. We came out throwing on first down a little bit. I think you're obviously going to know that this is a game that the first game Ohio state's going to review when they look at preparing for the next weekend's game. So I think if you're Josh Gaddis, you look at this as an opportunity to kind of mess with some of your tendencies. Uh, Most of the time when you get into the film room, you're going to have a breakdown, your first coaches meeting and here's first down run pass based on, you know, personnel. And this is an opportunity to skew some of those percentages. Uh, If you do your homework and you break it down game by game, you probably notice that this was an outlier game and maybe that, uh, keeps you from changing your game plan when you're scheming for us. But I think that was smart on our part was to look more balanced, look more passing based uh, just to give Ohio state something else to think about. Cause as much as you need to win this game and take Maryland and respect Maryland as an opponent, you also have to consider what information you're giving to other teams. And I think there was a lot of that going on in this game. What did you make of the effort on Saturday? I thought that for the most part, Michigan came out. They were up 31 to three uh, early on. And I think about halfway through the third quarter, uh, Maryland punched back. I think there were about like uh, between the two teams, maybe four touchdowns in the span of like five minutes of football. Um, Maryland, Maryland made a push after Michigan went up 31 to three. They got things kind of close at, uh, you know, at least the closest it would be the rest of the night at 38 to 18. How did you think, I mean, how did you feel like they responded to that in, Um, in terms of guys on all sides of the ball stepping up and making a play? Well, I think one thing that is something that's kind of shown up for us defensively with how many good things you can say about our defense, one thing we don't do well all the time is fit the run well when we're playing coverage. Obviously, when you're playing against a tag of Aloha, you're going to be playing a lot more coverage. You heard the broadcasters talk about in the game that Maryland's a pass-heavy offense. They're not really going to rely on their run. And kudos to them for bringing more of the run game to this game because I think they found some success that maybe they weren't even expecting. But I've noticed when we're in coverage, there's some times, especially when we're in a too high safety look, there's some times where we don't fit the run that well. And people can take advantage of that. And, yeah, you can take advantage of that with any defense that's playing too high safeties. But uh, I'd like to see us seal that up just a little bit better uh, because they were able to move the ball. The biggest thing is that our offense responded, our special teams responded, because there was a moment, just a moment, and it was brief, where it was 31-3, and then all of a sudden they scored a touchdown, and then they had another touchdown, two-point conversion, and I'm like, oh, 
let's just put this game away as you hear the crowd chant and beat Ohio. Um, let's just put this game away. And then, you know, you have the big, the big uh, special teams play that was brilliant design. You have JT Turner doing a balancing act on the sideline with a pick six uh, and some other guys showing up. So um, I was a little bit alarmed. There were some things to be a little concerned. There's definitely some things to clean up, but overall, uh, this team has grown and matured, I think, since the Indiana, since the Rutgers, since the Michigan State game, and that's what you're looking for. Yeah, let me ask you this, because th- again, like you said earlier, this was a this was a game where Michigan put a lot on film for Ohio State to think about going into next week. I mean, out of nowhere, Donovan Edwards caught the ball ten times for 170 yards. That's not a wrinkle we've seen at all this year. It was good to see him get an opportunity, and I think you called your shot in the Friday <laughs> show when you said that was the guy you were looking to to have a breakout game. So. Uh, good job on your part there, Ryan. But we also saw them, uh, J.J. McCarthy uh, came out, and we saw, again, kind of the full J.J. McCarthy experience as a runner, as a passer. Um, you know, just guys, uh, the special teams, the Mike Barrett toss over to the other side of the field to A.J. Henning. There was a lot of wrinkles that they they broke out in this game. And I know, like, some fans, and this was something I saw a lot on social media during the game, some fans are like, well, why would you do that now and not save it for next week? Um could you shed some light on my why why maybe we'd see something like that in a game like this? Well, the special teams play, my guess would be that we've seen Maryland go with this bloop kick in film in games previous, and their intention is to make it to where you don't field it, you have a question of who's supposed to go get this ball, and then all of a sudden it's basically like a long-distance onside kick is what it turns into. If Ohio State doesn't do the bloop kick, we didn't give them anything. This was a scheme for Maryland uh, specifically to, to, to get us a quick score would be my thought. Uh, the other thing is you want to throw some wrinkles. You know, one play that I thought specifically, like, why did we try that, was we had a, a red zone, second half red zone possession where McNamara motioned out and we did a direct snap to Haskins and he tried to power up the middle. That's, that's not low success percentage play. McNamara had a receiver. Who cares? No one's going to react to that. But it's just another thing that when you're in Ohio State, you're looking at game film, you're like, hey, this is something that they do. This is something that they do. You can only spend so much time dedicated to each personnel grouping, each position on the field. So you want to try and give them all these different looks. So they're preparing against things that maybe you don't even throw at them. Uh, You want to throw them off your set. So that's what you're trying to do X's and O's wise to make Ohio State game plan for things that they saw in other games that won't necessarily be in the deck for us versus them, but still it takes some time away from preparing for something that might be our bread and butter. So that's kind of what I think you're seeing go on as far as the chess match of the film room. What did you make of Cade McNamara's performance on Saturday? 21 to 28, 259 yards, two touchdowns. Again, um, you know, we see the star, the star making plays from, from JJ McCarthy and the flashy things he can do, but what we've seen over the last month or so is a guy who's really taken a step forward and, and leading what looks like is a pretty balanced offensive attack going into next week's game. He looked pretty good. There's some. T- I will lead with he would look pretty good, but I'll also say he's got some risk to him, especially on crossing routes. He has a slot with his arm uh, when he likes to throw the short underneath routes. It's kind of like Stafford used to do uh, from the side, and he's led to a, it's led to a lot of. Uh, balls hitting his offensive lineman helmets, hitting defensive lineman helmets, and they popped up in the air and they haven't cost us. Against Ohio State, that's going to be a game wrecker if, if that occurs. And it's a simple fix. So I'm hoping that we can get that figured out because uh, not to throw a shot at, at McNamara, he played a great game, like I said, but uh, that's something that stood out to me is we've got to fix this because this isn't the first game that I've seen this. Yep. And uh, he's not the biggest guy in the world already. So to throw from a sidearm in the pocket, Ugh, it's kind of tough, especially over the middle. It makes you hold your breath. Uh, but he, other than that, he threw some good balls. The thing I've always loved about McNamara is that he gives his guys chances to make plays, but he doesn't put the ball into the defender's hands. Very rarely do you see a defensive guy get a hand on a McNamara ball. And that's an underrated quality of not just him, but any quarterback that can have that precision and accuracy and awareness to know I can put it to the inside and deep, but I can't put it outside and short on this route versus this coverage. He knows all those things and they're routine for him. One thing, that I will say is another quick hit, and it's not necessarily on him, but on our offensive line too. He does struggle a little bit when he has to move his feet when there's pressure or he feels pressure coming in. I feel like he gets leany and leans back, and that sidearm comes out a little bit more. Doesn't necessarily impact his like ability to throw towards the defense. He still doesn't put the ball at risk for defense, 
but he doesn't throw a great ball to our guys and makes our guys it makes our guys struggle a little bit. It's a little bit on him. You got to stand up tall, know the hits coming, and make a good throw. It's a little bit on us, our offensive line. We've got to do better on post snap movement, whether it's pressure or just games up front. There's times where we have a hard time exchanging guys up at the line of scrimmage, uh, and those are all things that Ohio State's going to see, and they're going to try and manipulate and use in their favor. So um, overall, great game, but there's a couple things that we've got to make sure we're tight on going into the last game in order to you know have the best chance at winning. Yeah, what what ha- we'll talk about the Ohio State Michigan State game in a little bit here, uh, you know, because uh, frankly, I mean, this is a pretty thorough, dominant Michigan victory. I don't know, and we have a podcast to do tomorrow as well, so. We'll do some of the deeper dive stuff there, but I want to talk about, you know, there, your chances in next week's game are going to come down to what you're probably able to do defensively. Uh, Maryland on the, or Maryland as an attack in this game, 359 total yards, 178 yards to the air, a little bit of a concern with the rush yards, 181 yards. Uh, but uh, Maryland, it seemed like they, we've talked about meat left on the bone throughout the year for Michigan's offense. There were some drops. There were some errant throws, uh, obviously some mistakes from tug of Iowa. Um, you know, Michigan's defense, I think did what it had to do. If I had to grade this game, it would probably be like maybe a B, uh, B, you know, B, whatever it is. Uh, but pass rush was kind of quiet. <laughs> only, only two sacks on the day. One of them was from Vincent gray. The other was from TJ guy, which was late in the game. And that's not to say that Aiden Hutchinson and David Ojabo didn't make some plays in this game, but, um, in a matchup where you feel like that's pretty lopsided in Michigan's favor, those guys have to be on next week. So do you feel like there was a little bit of momentum lost with, you know, just it just didn't seem like the pass rush was getting as, as close to home as it usually does? This is a game where I feel like the lack of a dominant defensive tackle in pass rush is, gonna, is hurting us because there were times where you saw Jabo and Hutchinson win, and they made a slight error every now and again of getting too deep and getting past the quarterback. But part of that was that Tagovailoa had – a good two to three good hitch steps forward uh, of room to move in the pocket because we don't have anything collapsing in the middle. Uh, also, you got to credit Tagovailoa is probably one of the most elusive quarterbacks in the Big Ten, if not the most elusive quarterback, at least in the pocket that I've seen so far this year. Um, so you've got to credit him for making some plays. He makes not just those guys miss, but everybody miss. So um, that's a credit to him. But we definitely need to find some defensive tackle presence. Uh, I thought Mozzie Smith played awesome in the run game today. Uh, we didn't have a lot of guys play awesome, but I thought he played really well in the run game today. But him and uh, Hinton, we don't we, we haven't found Jeter. He's a decent pass rusher, but we haven't found a guy that, that can win consistently in the middle. And that's a surprise considering you've got Ojabo and Hutchinson drawing so much attention. You know, we should be able to find a three technique nose guard, someone that can get some kind of pressure or at least can lapse, collapse the pocket so you don't have the opportunity to step up. That'll be huge against Stroud next weekend. So uh, I thought it was, you know, a little bit of a more quiet game for them, both because we weren't getting enough push in the middle and because Tagovailoa is such a good athlete and was elusive all game. Yeah, I know your your eyes probably always kind of gravitate to what's going on in the trenches, but I want to move to the back seven here for a bit. Uh, Brad Hawkins was uh, apparently injured early on in this game, meaning that R.J. Moten and Rod Moore uh, got a little more run on the back end. Um, you know, D.J. Turner obviously made the play of the game with the pick six and tiptoeing down the sideline, but um, I want to talk about Rod Moore for a second because that's a guy who got his first start last week as a true freshman someone who, when we talk to Michigan players and Michigan coaches this week uh, in Ann Arbor, this is a guy that they said, you know, he watches as much film and, and has come on as strong as anybody on the team in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I thought Rod Moore had a really nice game and some really nice moments throughout the, um, throughout the afternoon on Saturday. But just how would you, how would you sum up how the defensive backs played? I thought they played well. I mean, Tagovailoa had a lot of time on these scrambles. I mean, we're mentioning that Hutchinson and Ojabo weren't able to get home. A lot of the times they're in coverage for three plus, four plus seconds, and the longer a play extends, the harder it is to stick to your guy and, and play coverage. And these guys were in good position, which is why he was made to hold the ball for so long, and these plays extended all the way to the sidelines. And the ones that he did complete are, you know, dirt throws that the guy's coming back and just sliding in to get. Those are tough. Those are tough to defend against when you're playing over top. So – they obviously were in good position all game. I think these personnel-wise, they probably weren't challenged as much as they obviously will be coming up. Um, but this was a good opportunity, especially with Hawkins going down, for some other guys to play because there's definitely a continuity element to your secondary, uh, just like there is to any other position group, offensive line, defensive line. But secondary-wise, 
you're on the biggest stage because you have a blown coverage, it's touchdown. So, and everybody knows. So uh, it was good that these guys are in good position. They are going to be, you know, the key to victory next week. So um, get these guys reps, get them uh, in good positions. And uh, today was a good showing for them. Yeah, before we move on to, since we are live on YouTube, thank you guys uh, for watching. If you're here, uh, please make sure to hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you're listening after the fact uh, to the podcast, thank you for being here as well. Uh, upon your initial view, any more positives that we haven't talked about yet? And then we'll jump into some questions here. I would say, I mean, I'm proud of the Edwards call. It wasn't the way I said he'd impact the game, but for some reason I had a really good feeling he was going to be an impact player. Um, you know, I would say that, I was really impressed with uh, Andrell Anthony. Obviously, the one opportunity he had, he makes a big, great catch. Uh, Henning, I think that he's a guy we got to find a way to get him some touches offensively somehow, some way, because I think he's a good talent. Uh, Sandra still coming down with the big play. Um, you know, I honestly, not to throw shade, but I just think Cornelius Johnson had that one drop. But other than that, he played a pretty solid game. Our receiving core has been playing well enough. Well enough. Roman Wilson has a catch that I think gets negated because of a penalty, but he had a great catch on a fade uh, and goes up and wins a one-on-one -on -one ball. Our guys winning one-on-one -on -one balls when we need them to was something that I think we all thought took a hit when Ronnie Bell goes down first game of the season. But now that we have these guys kind of making plays when they're asked to, I think that's a big sign. Again, just like our safeties versus personnel-wise in the Maryland game, our receivers versus the Maryland secondary is not what you're going to see next weekend. It's not an elite secondary in the Big Ten. Uh, but the fact that these guys are getting their numbers called, making plays, um, contested catches, those are things that from a young receiving core that we really didn't know what to expect from. I'm very happy with where they're at, how they've developed, and uh, the future is definitely bright for our receiving core. Yeah, getting good contributions from those guys when you need them. Uh, hey, listen, you're not we're not going to be 100% on bold predictions, but you called a Donovan Edwards breakout game. I said that Michigan would have three passing touchdowns. They did. They were also – I said that they would score all their points without Jake Moody kicking a field goal. He did kick one field goal, but Michigan was 6-for-6 six six in the red zone. Just, again, um, pretty clean effort across the board. Uh, touchdowns in all three phases of the game. Can't really complain about the effort that we saw on saturday so i am going to pull up a couple questions here we're doing this live so it takes me a second uh well while i do that i mean early thoughts on ohio state we all saw what happened uh michigan state was just snapped off of the face of the earth uh, on saturday that was that was that was a bad effort on their part but ohio state you know that when you look at a team that we talk about teams that are peaking at the right time they have moved past that Oregon loss and kind of run through Big Ten play like a lot of us expected them to. Yeah, I think Michigan State went into that game trying to get a little cute uh, in that they were doing a little more passing and getting behind the sticks a little bit and led to them punting. And defensively, they just got shredded. I mean, just absolutely shredded. And I almost don't even say that as a knock to Michigan State. I think – I we all kind of saw it coming. I think one of the things that was the biggest indicator was that they're, you know, 20 point favorites basically uh, to whatever Michigan state was ranked number seven, number seven team in the country. I don't know. I feel like that might be the largest point spread for, you know, a four versus seven ever. Uh, but um, their, their receiving core is so elite and their quarterback is, you know, he's a freshman, but with all the experience he now has under his belt, he's no longer a freshman. He's seen plenty of snaps. So um, they're just, I think you pretty common knowledge that they are the best offense, especially at least passing attack offense in the country this year. And everybody's going to struggle to slow them down, especially if you get out athleted, which is, I think is what happened unfortunately against Michigan state. And um, you know, they, they are, they can strike at any point in time. You can, we could be up by 21 in the third quarter, fourth quarter against Ohio state. And you're still going to be on the edge of your seat because these guys can score fast. So uh, I feel that Michigan State had very little chance. I feel like their game plan gave them even less of a chance. And I feel like Ohio State is uh, doing what they do, playing their best football in November. That's what we talk about. As far as Michigan, we haven't been that. We haven't necessarily gotten better as the year went on. And uh, Ohio State's humming on all 8, 10, 12 cylinders, whatever you want to call it. We're humming too. And uh, hopefully we can come into a nice competitive weekend and be around. We'll talk more about it, but be around to win that game. Yeah, this will end up being, and like you said, we will talk about it throughout the week. I'm sure we'll hit on it a little bit tomorrow, but 
this will be the first time in the Jim Harbaugh era that you get a sh- you get a crack at the Buckeyes. One playing your best football in November. They have just continued to take that step every single week, and also you're getting a shot at the Buckeyes at home with the Big Ten East on the line. It's just, no matter which way you slice how this year has gone so far and what the expectations were. There's no, there's nothing more you could have asked for than the position that that both of these teams find themselves in. Uh, to kind of piggyback on what we were talking about, this is from Theodore Frazier. He says, OSU is a quick strike offense. If we make them go the length of the field all game or three quarters of the game, they will look like a different team. How do you feel about that? I agree, um, uh, at least in principle with what you're saying. I, I, I've thought about what would your game plan be? How do you slow down this offense? And the answer is try to keep them in front of you as best you can. That's why I brought up earlier, it concerns me that we don't fit the run great when we're playing more coverage-based defense because Ohio State has good enough running backs that they're going to take advantage of it. But it's almost like you might have to give up some chunks and be willing to give up some chunks of 10, 12, 15 yards so you don't give up a 40-plus yard touchdown. So I agree. I mean, the way to the way to compete and be around for Ohio State is to not give them 25 possessions because they're going to score on 20 of them you know this is this is a team that you need to limit how many possessions they get uh hopefully we can generate a turnover or two but the more plays that they run the better sounds weird but the more plays that they run the better the odds will be in our favor and so I, in that element i agree with you yeah I, we haven't really seen them take the long way a lot you know put together those 10 12 13 14 play drives we know that Michigan's content to do that. They'll play that type of game all day. So if that's the type of game you find uh, yourselves in with the Buckeyes, um, I guess you can't really complain about that too much. Uh, This one's from American Defender. He says you'll have to pressure Ohio State to win on Saturday. Uh, That doesn't seem like a hot take either, does it, Ryan? Uh, I don't know about that. I, I mean, you have to generate pressure, yes. But if you're saying that you have to pressure with personnel, meaning you're bringing five or six, that means you're leaving four or five in coverage versus the best receiving core, like we talked about, in the country. So you're asking for the big play. Now, you get home, you're you're brilliant, you know, and you're right. Uh, but if you don't get home and you get torched, you're going to be down by 21, you know, in the with eight minutes left in the first quarter like Michigan State was. So, uh yeah, that's the double-edged sword there. The one thing that I do think we have working in our favor, obviously, is we got Ojabo and Hutchinson. These are guys that can get pressure with a four-man rush, meaning that you can keep, you know, seven in coverage, six if you want to do a spy. I don't know that that's necessary, but um, and give you a chance to to double up or or trap, run a trap zone where where you get C.J. Stroud to throw the ball into coverage once or twice. That'll be huge, especially if we can limit their amount of possessions, make them play the long game. If we can find a way to generate one or two turnovers that's really going to lead uh, to us having an opportunity and, again, being around in the end. If we if they play a clean game with zero turnovers and their offense gets what they want, I don't see us standing up to them. But um, I don't know that I would I would be very selective. I would not blitz. I would not blitz anywhere outside of our own red zone, to be honest with you, uh, unless I saw something that I really liked on film. I'm dedicating guys to coverage. I'm keeping them in front of me, and I'm not letting them get a 30-yard banger on us, 30-yard plus. All right, this we'll get you. We'll get ourselves out of here on this, Ryan. Let me just ask you one simple question: Is this team ready for Ohio State? They're as ready as they can be. They're as ready as they can be. Um, Ohio State. I, I was thinking about this. Bama almost went down today to Arkansas. Almost. Um, you know, Oregon. I think was a fluke. I, I honestly, they line up and play that game ten times. I think Ohio State wins at nine. It just they weren't ready for that game. Kind of like Michigan State caught us with our pants around our ankles with uh, the tempo. Uh, and it just was a fluke. We weren't ready for it. Oregon did some things that Ohio State hadn't seen, and they happened to run away with that game. But I think Ohio State, Georgia's a clear number one. I think Ohio State can challenge for the second best team in the country. And it's kind of one of those weird things because I feel like, you know, one, two, three, maybe four are all, you know, you play these games, these guys play against each other, toss up who wins it. But once you do like two versus five or two versus six, there might be a bigger disparity there. I think that's what we're going to find out this weekend is, are we going to be able to compete? You know, I, I'm, I have no idea. I can't speak to the odds of winning the Ohio State game. Well, I think we're ready, but it's a matter of uh, are we going to be able to compete? Because there's a there's definitely a, a tier one and a tier two, and I think that there's a pretty quick split when you start talking about rankings: the first, second, third, fourth best team in the country. You know, I I don't know. I I, I don't know if we're going to be able to compete with this team, but I think in the Big Ten, for Ohio State being second, third best team in the country, we are the best equipped team 
to give them a ch give them a challenge. And so I know we're going to give them the best swing that we have. Uh, there's nothing but motivation for these guys uh, that are wearing the maize and blue. So um, we should expect their best shot, and we'll see what that ha what happens. Maybe our best shot's not good enough, but I think we're going to get our best shot. All right. Any other final thoughts on the Maryland game? No, just good. We said we wanted it mattered how they won this game. I think how they won this game was a good indicator that they are ready. And answer your, your last question. So um, I'm going to be excited. I told my wife as soon as the game ended before Harbaugh's interview, Ohio State week, it's time. And uh, <laughs> I'm excited. I get geeked up. I'm sweating right now just thinking about it because this is everything you want when you're a Michigan fan, when you're a Michigan player. Uh, a chance to compete and beat Ohio State and go to the Big Ten Championship, ruin their season, make yours a success. Everything's on the line. You know, you're all in and uh, standing up at a poker table and we're watching the river. So I'm excited. Well, people have waited for a killer instinct from Michigan. They've waited for them to be more explosive, to run away from teams. 35 second half points, 59-18 final score. It's It's everything that we needed to see from them this week. So uh, Ryan, Ryan and I will come back tomorrow, not live. It'll be pre-recorded, but we will burn down this game a little bit more things. We see things we liked concerns. We might have ahead of next week's game. Uh, thank you guys for watching again. If you are here, uh, subscribe, we need you to do that. That would be very helpful. Also, uh, info for all the podcasts. We're on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. So subscribe to us there. Leave a five-star review. Leave us good feedback. Uh, the Wolverine.com is on the On3 network. A lot of good stuff is going to be coming out of this game, heading into Ohio State Week. All of our Ohio State Week coverage uh, is there for you. All the insider stuff, you can get it for a dollar for the next year. It's an absolute steal, so info to do that is also in the description below. Uh, for Ryan Van Bergen, this is Anthony Broom. Michigan wins 59-18, 10-1. Big Ten East title is on the line next Saturday in Ann Arbor. You'd have it no other way. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you again soon.